Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a perfumers portfolio video and I'm loving that I'm seeing some perfumers portfolio videos circulating Fragcom as of late, especially on some of the bigger channels. Makes me happy that the perfumers are kind of getting their dues. And um, I kind of started this perfumers portfolio idea on my channel as a way to not just give credit to the people behind the fragrance. You know, for the longest time they were um, almost seen as like uh, maybe not even secondary, but like not even thought about members of the of the team, which is almost impossible to think of nowadays that the perfumers are almost at the heart of um, many, you know, many houses put them at the heart now of what they do. Frederick Mall really started that trend by putting the names on the bottles and the packaging, and uh, it's really snowballed from then. And um, I decided to do these perfumers portfolio videos to, you know, not just give kind of the spotlight where I felt like it was due, but also as a way, as an interesting way to talk about a bunch of fragrances. And I found that if you end up liking the style of a perfumer, sometimes even a better way of hunting down fragrances that will fit what you're looking for as far as, you know, the texture and the feeling and the creativity of a fragrance is to follow the perfumer, not the house, not the fragrance house itself, but the perfumer themselves as they kind of bounce around to different houses. And so then I got the idea, you know what? Everyone wanted to know because whenever I initially did these videos, I did them unranked where I would just show you a bunch of stuff on my collection and say, hey, hey, these are my collection from this particular perfumer, but they would be unranked. And then people started to ask, well, what's your favorite? And so I said, you know what? Let's go back and rank these. And so I've ranked a couple of them now. I ranked uh, Anique Minardo and Pierre Bourdon and um, maybe one other so far. Uh, so I'm very early on in my ranking of the perfumers. And today we're going to rank an, a star in the, in the fragrance game. He's loved by some. He's hated by some. Uh, he has an absolutely immense portfolio of work. When you go to Parfumo and click on this gentleman's name... Uh, he has 23 pages of uh, perfumes you can kind of scroll through. It is Alberto Moria. So let me read you a little blurb about Alberto Morias, and then uh, we'll talk about some of the fragrances that are in my collection that I've either talked about, have full bottles of, have samples of, that I've done reviews on or that I will do reviews on. So there's going to be, in all, there's going to be 17 fragrances in this uh, in this countdown list, and they will be ranked from my... Uh, least favorite to my most favorite at the time. And remember, this is subjective, obviously. These are ranked based on my personal taste today. Ask me tomorrow, they very well may change. But as of today, these are ranked based on my personal taste. And so 17 Alberto Morias fragrances in my collection. So before we do that, though, we are going to do Scent of the Day. And Scent of the Day uh, is the first time that I've worn this out of this particular packaging. Uh, I wore a sample that Senator Eddie sent to sent to me uh, to, to get to know, and I loved it so much I ended up buying a bottle, actually off of him. And it's uh, Ensar Oud's E01, uh, the original E01. The original bottles actually had the, the bottom of the um, leather that was made. These are made by hand, actually, by the same person that makes the leather that goes around the Pope's Bible in the Vatican. He's a very well-renowned leather maker, very artistic gentleman, uh, and you can find some information on him, I think, on Ensar's YouTube page. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, the original bottles had the bottom uh, on them, and then they ended up coming just with these sides, so it was bottomless. There was nothing on the bottom. Uh, so that's one way to kind of tell an older from a newer formulation, if you if you will. But uh, EO number one is is my favorite Ensar that I've tried so far, and I've been craving oud lately. You know, oud for me is I was never a big oud head, like not in the sense that some people go down this oud rabbit hole. I mean, I've always liked oud, and you'll actually see very uh, a couple of our top picks, even in Alberto Morias, who is like one of the most mainstream of mainstream perfumers you can talk about, is going to be centered around oud today, uh, whether it's oud itself, or whether it's, you know, the creation of an oud accord using other ingredients like cypriol and stuff like that. Um, you know, oud is, uh, is an important part now of just the fragrance game, period. I don't think it's going away. It's not just a trend that's going to 
uh, pass by. Now, the common rose oud, you know, I've been testing a lot of Zerzhovs, and you go back and you smell some of these from 10, 11, 12 years ago, and you're like, you know what? These smell kind of passe now. They smell past their time. Um, but it, I think it's just the combination of kind of the, you know, rose, oud, amber. It just gets boring when you've smelled it for a thousandth time, right? This house is the uh, exact opposite of boring. This and Arise La Dore and uh, Bort uh, Bortnikov, Dmitry Bortnikov's house, they're kind of like, uh, you know, rekindling a fire for modern perfumery for me because you guys know I love vintage fragrances. They're probably where my true heart is in, in the past. Uh, someone told me the best line that I've ever said on this channel is the way to go forward is to go backwards in perfumery. And it's true. You know, much of the modern stuff nowadays is just garbage. It just is. They're using the same boring chemicals from the big oil houses and every house is doing it. And when something doesn't sell, they just discontinue it and hype something else, um, you know, with a new advertising campaign with the same chemical molecules that, uh, you know, LVMH or uh, L'Oreal or whoever used in the previous one that got discontinued. So modern perfumery doesn't move me anymore. But Oud has that animalic sometimes. There's so many different. That's the thing about the Oud rabbit hole is you can go deep, right? But there's so many different things about Oud. Uh, it has sometimes it can have that animalic, woody, smoky, leathery aspect. Uh, there's all different types. There's different styles. But this is basically a Oud leather with uh, castorium. And a couple other things like Amazing Rose and um, Tolu Balsam, Sandalwood, multiple types of Sandalwood and Tobacco and Ambergris. And the Ambergris in here is really amazing. You don't really smell it, which I guess you shouldn't smell Ambergris. It's supposed to be a note that kind of accentuates the other notes. It's the, it's the note that makes the other notes more uh, eye-popping, more vibrant. And, you know, you do get this kind of sparkle, though. Uh, but I, could I say I'd really pick out ambergris? You know, it's one of those things. You get this mineralic, sea-like, animalic, you know, because it comes from an animal. It comes from the sperm whale. Um, and so the ambergris in this, the oud in this, the, you know, it's a very wearable leather. At first, I thought this was too boring for me. And I did a review on it. Actually, you can go watch it from a, a little sample that Eddie sent to me. And um, I just thought, you know what? This is good. But I like my leathers more challenging and more animalic. Like, I like stuff like Bellamy, right? Or Chanel's Antaeus or something like that from the past when they were big, bold, animalic leathers. Uh, uh, Caniche 10 from 1925, that kind of stuff, right? And then the, the more I kind of played with this and I wore it to bed multiple times, pretty much drained that sample that he sent me. Um, I was like, you know what? I, I need a bottle of this. I do. Um, it's my only NSAR in my collection, and I've really, really enjoyed wearing it today. Yes, really enjoyed wearing it. And I'm, I'm kind of, I need to watch myself because I feel like I'm kind of turning into a little bit of an oud head all of a sudden, and that can be a very expensive endeavor, especially when you're talking $500 to $1,000 a bottle for something like this. Uh, I've got to kind of watch myself, but I'm just content enjoying what I have in my collection at this point, and I definitely enjoyed wearing this today. So Ensar Oud, EO number one is my scent of the day. All right, let's talk about Alberto Mordias, and let me read you a little blurb and interesting facts, if you will, from Parfumo. It says, the elegant gentleman among perfumers, Alberto Mordias likes to describe himself as a constant seeker of new scents, born and raised in the wild south of Spain. The Andalusian is deep is still deeply connected to his roots. He associates his first conscious scent experience with the garden in his parents' house in Seville. This was home to the local orange trees, but also allowed the young Alberto to breathe in the scents of carnations and jasmines daily. He moved with his parents to Switzerland when he was 11 years old, where he began but never finished his studies in art history as a prestigious Ecole de Beaux Arts. The culprit of his rebellion was none other than Jean-Paul Guerlain. An interview with him in Vogue inspired him to indulge in the art of perfume making. He applied to Fermination 1970, to which he continues to lend his old style nose. As he says himself, the traditional company, which has been a global player in the fragrances and essences field since 1895, is the largest privately owned company of its kind in the world. Since 1998, Alberto Mordias has allowed to call himself Master Perfumer. His way to Olympus of perfumers was paved by 
his world famous fragrance creations and they actually have a list list of them and i don't think i own any from the list well maybe a couple um there is cartier's musta cartier 2 from the 90s i own the original musta cartier but not part two calvin klein ck1 don't own it had a bottle in the in the 90s don't own it now when i was a kid it was one of my childhood fragrances tommy hilfiger tommy don't own it estee lauder pleasures don't own it Giorgio Armani Aqua de Joe, probably the best-selling men's fragrance of all time. Don't own it, and I don't like it. Uh, Givenchy's Pie, would like to own it, but I would like a vintage bottle. Uh, just hard to find. If anyone has a partial or a vintage, reach out to me. Cherry Mugler's Cologne, don't own it, because I have this instead. I have um, uh, Original Vetiver, which, by the way, I'm going to put this in the rumor mill category. So you can go ahead and put this in the rumor mill. But... Alberto Morias made um, Cherry Mugler's cologne, uh, which I think is now discontinued, shockingly. And um, again, L'Oreal just butchered the Cherry Mugler line. They just absolutely took a hatchet to the Cherry Mugler properly. All of the amen, all, you know, uh, just what they did to the Cherry Mugler. They should be tried for crimes against the fragrance community for what they did. Absolutely scandalous, uh, the bastards. So, um, this is rumored to be a Alberto Morias creation. Now, rumored, okay? It's not official. Actually, if you go look on Parfumo or Fragrantica or Base Notes or something like that, uh, you will not find, uh, original vetiver credited to Alberto Morias. However, this came out in 2004 and it, it features notes of bergamot, Vetiver leaf, mandarin orange, bitter orange, pink pepper, coriander, white pepper, musk, vetiver, sandalwood, and ambergris. And if you've ever smelled Terry Mugler's um, cologne, it's just called Mugler cologne, you will get an instant connection. I mean, it's almost undeniable. Uh, Mugler cologne came out in 2001. This came out in 2004. So there is a rumor that Alberto Morias is the perfumer behind this, but it's unfounded. Okay. So, um... Uh, Bulgari Omnia, don't own it. Dolce & Gabbana Light Blue Pour Homme, don't own it. Marc Jacobs Daisy, don't own it. Narciso Rodriguez Essence, don't own it. Bulgari Man, don't own it. Gucci Bloom, don't own it. So those are the ones they picked as his, paved his way to world famous fragrance creations, as uh, Parfumo says. Alberto Morias was awarded the Prix Francois Coty in 2003, this was followed by the Fragrance Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in 2013, but he's not stopping anytime soon. In addition to his work at, for Fermanish, he launched his product line in 1999 under the brand Meisenser, which I've never smelled and I hear terrible things about. So honestly, I mean, if anyone has samples or something they want to send me, I'll be glad to talk about it on the channel, but I do not, I did not hear good things about his Meisenser brand. Um, so there you have it. There's a little blurb on uh, Alberto Morias. And so we're going to do 17 fragrances. We're going to start with a sample. And I will do a review on this on the channel before this sample is gone. But this is one of, this is actually, and I know I don't have a full bottle. And maybe my hate is misguided because it's only a sample. And someone sent me this sample, you know, for something. I don't know how I got in my collection. Because um, I certainly, uh, I don't I don't buy my samples. I don't think I've hardly ever purchased a sample. All of my samples you see I've acquired from freebies with a purchase or friends kind of sending me samples to talk about. Um, but this is uh, Versace Porom Dylan Blue. I absolutely despise, I hate, I hate Dylan Blue like with a passion, with a red hot flaming passion. It's one of the most disgusting, synthetic, uh, that disgusting, boring, aquatic thing with that uh, you know, Tonka underneath is, it's just the epitome. It is literally the epitome. Like, this is what I could point to as everything wrong in the fragrance game today. Literally. I hate Versace Pour Homme Dylan Blue. <coughs> um, apparently there's a fig leaf note in here. I've never smelled anything that smells close to a fig. It just smells like a disgusting, boring, uh, designer aquatic with, uh, some generic musks and stuff like that underneath. It's, it's, it's the epitome of, you know, uh, soulless perfumery. This is the epitome of, this is why 
This is the type of perfume that make frag heads hate Alberto Morias. Now, once we get closer to the top of my list, you're going to see he's made some amazing fragrances. Actually, some of my favorites. Uh, the top five, top six, top seven is littered with um, just amazing examples of perfumery. Versace Pour of Dylan Blue is not it, though. Um, not it at all. I'll review it. I just need to look up some more um, angry descriptors before I do. Uh, so that's number 17. Number 16 is going to be a fragrance from the house of Salvatore Ferragamo. Now, you guys may be shocked that this is this low, but I really don't like this. For me, this is uh, way too sweet. And if you know my taste, you know I don't like sweet fragrances. And however, if you like sweet fragrances, this may be for you. I just think that uh, no man should walk around smelling of tiramisu. That's just my opinion, okay? I'm 37 years old, but I'm old school in the head. And uh, I don't think a man, which this is marketed towards men, I don't think a man should walk around smelling like tiramisu, okay? Um, just one man's opinion. Uh, this is Salvatore Ferragamo's Womo. And I have a tester bottle, so I don't have that ridiculous cap everyone complains about. It wobbles and doesn't spray right and, you know, but yes, I have the... Um, I have the uh, tester version, so I don't have that crazy round cap that most the built-in sprayer thing that, you know, a lot of people complain about. But this is basically a sweet gourmand. And it's the epitome of everything I hate in a sweet gourmand for men. It's marketed towards men. It's got a freaking tiramisu note, which again, just the thought, just the thought of it just boils my blood. Um, you see, it's making me angry. Versace... Uh, Dylan Blue, Pour Homme, and, and Salvatore Ferragamo's Womo, they will make me angry. Uh, they get the ram's blood boiling. Uh, so it's it's uber sweet, super, super sweet. Um, just like, it's a walking dessert. You're a walking dessert. Uh, and if I walk by wearing Antaeus, and you walk by wearing this, who do you think is going to smell more juvenile? Someone got upset the other day at me because I said sweet fragrances are juvenile. Well, I mean, just think about it. I'm wearing Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. You're wearing Salvatore Ferragamo Womo. Who looks more like the teenager, you know? Uh, sweet fragrances to me are juvenile. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, everyone has their own taste. But in my book, I see sweet fragrances as uh, less sophisticated, as, you know, less austere, as less, um, you know, it doesn't have that gravitas about it, doesn't have that, uh, you know, you, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking up to someone and meeting them for the very first time and what they associate me with is this. I would want them to associate them with my favorites, Leonard Poron and Bellamy, and, you know, the list goes on, right? Um, and all of all the vintage fragrances I've talked about in the past, I'd feel much more comfortable with, with something like that than with with this. And so that's my problem with this, you know, and I, and I, and I am hard on it. And I think it deserves to be hard on because I mean, this is just jumping on a trend. If I'm going to wear this type of perfumery, I'd rather just say wear Amen. Honestly, Amen for me is my masculine gourmand. That's the one that I can stand for whatever reason. Maybe the sweetness was done differently uh, in the nineties. This is 2016. This came out. There's a huge Ambroxan note. Uh, you'll notice with his perfumes, and it's the same with Versace Pour Homme. There's a giant, excuse me, dose of Ambroxan. Uh, and he actually works with other perfumers a lot. So, uh, Alberto Morias, a lot of times, there are multiple perfumers who work on a fragrance. And so, for example, for Salvatore Ferragamo's Womo, uh, this is Alberto Morias and Aurelien Guichard. So... Uh, you'll see a lot of times he's kind of part of this duo, but if you like the idea of smelling like tiramisu, here's your fragrance. I mean, it is, uh, but just beware. I mean, it is sweet, 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 sweet. I mean, you could have a sweet tooth and think this is too sweet. So, uh, number 16, Salvatore Ferragamo's Womo from 2016. Number 15 is a Givenchy he did, uh, over 20 years ago. I can't believe it's been 20 years. Um... Uh, and this is a Givenchy fragrance, and this is called Givenchy's Pour Homme. Now, a 
quick word to the wise here. My bottle is older, so I don't know if you can see this, but it actually just says uh, Givenchy Paris on the bottom. I don't know if there's been reformulations with this juice. I have no clue. All I know is that um, the box that I actually bought this in is different than the modern box. So uh, I have no clue about reformulations, but just thought I would throw that out there. This is a 2002 release, uh, and it is considered a fresh, spicy fragrance. And the reason this ends up beating out the first three is I like the way that the lavender and cedar and labdanum all come together. But it basically smells like a modern, you know, fresh designer, woody fragrance, if you will. There's woody aspects to this. And um, there's grapefruit, there's mandarin orange, uh, there's coriander. And, you know, if you want to wear something that's going to be spicy, more masculine, this is more generically masculine to my nose than... Uh, the first two, um, I would I would look at something like this. There's nothing wrong with this. It just doesn't move me. You know, it, it's it's um, it's not. I wouldn't call it soulless like I did with uh, Versace Dylan Blue Pour Homme, uh, but I would say we're really starting to move into that designer esque feel. And by this time, uh, Alberto Moria's career was really starting to kick into high gear. We're going to talk about some fragrances from the past where you'd be shocked he made. I mean, literally, you would be, you're going to be shocked on some of these. If you don't know that he did fragrances going back to the 70s and 80s, you wouldn't believe they're Alberto Mordias's work. Completely different perfumer. Now he's really starting to kind of kick into high gear. This is when he really starts pumping stuff out. Aqua de Joe was a hit, and now all of a sudden everyone kind of wants him, and he is a hot commodity at this point. Uh, Any, you know, uh, people like his work. It's He makes fragrances that are easy to wear in situations like this. And I really feel like there's this tug of rope going on at, when people talk about his career because many people accuse him of being too bland and boring and designerish. And I completely understand that. But on the other hand, was he just following a brief? You know, was 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 he just following the brief that the brand gave that the brand gave him? Um, and that's kind of the question that people have to ask each other whenever, because when we get to the top of the list, you're going to see he is more than capable of making amazing perfume. It's just, he got in with so many of these designer houses early on. You're going to see, uh, the Gucci's, you're going to see the Dolce & Gabbana's, you know, you're going to see the YSL's, um, and... So, you know, you have to kind of ask yourself, the Versace's, is he just, is that just who he is as a perfumer, or is that what the brief is asking him? That's kind of the tug, the tug of war, if you will. But uh, Givenchy Pour Homme, not a bad fragrance, but it's not going to blow you away if you smelled a lot of stuff at number 15. Number 14, and this is actually, I think, the earliest example of an Alberto Murias fragrance that I have in my collection. It goes all the way back to the 70s, actually 1978 to be exact. I think it might be his first big hit, probably not his first fragrance, but his first big hit fragrance, and it's called Om de Café. And I have an older bottle of this. I don't know if you can see, but it says COFCI right there on the bottom. Um, and I really don't know about newer bottles of this. Uh, all I know is that this is an underrated scent. And this easily probably could have been higher, but... Um, it, uh, you know, I think this is a fair spot for it. It beats out the first three, and it's woody, it's spicy, it has a beautiful note of clove, clove leaf to be exact, mixed with raspberry. And that clove leaf mixed with raspberry, mixed with cedar wood, which this I also think has a nice cedar wood note. He does a decent woody note. Um, and so the cedar wood in here mixes with bergamot and orange, and it just gives it this spicy... Uh, old school masculine feel. If you like spicy fragrances, if you're a fan of spicy fragrances, this is definitely one to check out. Om de Cafe. And don't let the, um, don't let the cafe vibe, you know, put you off. I don't really understand the whole coffee beans on the bottle here. The name of the house is actually Parfums Cafe. Uh, I don't get it. There's nothing coffee in this is what I'm trying to say. It's mostly a woody, spicy fragrance that um, that clove leaf is very evident, 
all right? It, it's a very evident note. And uh, if you don't like clove, this might be one to try still. Even if you don't like clove, this might be uh, a fragrance that kind of changes your mind on it because it's very elegantly done here. And you know what? People think this is a cheap fragrance because it, it is a cheap fragrance. I think it's uh, being marketed now for like $10 or something. You can find this at discounters all day for 10 bucks. And, you know, because of that, I think people just associate this as being a cheap fragrance. I look at it more as Alberto Mordias's early work. And his early style was completely different from his later style. And even a decade later, towards the 80s, at the end of the 80s, he was much closer to this style than he would be what he ended up turning into. Um, and so, Homme de Café from 1978 by Alberto Morias. I think the very oldest Alberto Morias fragrance in my collection at number uh, 14. Number 13 is a sample, and I will do an early impression or, you know, a, a quick hit video on this, if you will. It's from the House of Bulgari. I don't own a full bottle. It's called Bulgari's Man in Black. And this got a lot of hype over the years. This has been kind of one of the most hyped uh, designer fragrances. It gets compared a lot to, um, it gets compared a lot to this, to Spice Bomb, Spice Bomb. Actually, this is Spice Bomb Extreme, but it gets compared to the original Spice Bomb. Uh, and there is some comparison there. Uh, I think Spice Bomb maybe adds a note or two that uh, is not in Bulgari's Man in Black. But this is basically rum, tobacco, leather, Oris Absolute, which really surprised me that there's a, you know, Oris is a extremely expensive ingredient normally. So there's Oris Absolute, there's Tuberose in here, uh, which also really surprised me. Not what I was expecting. Uh, actually, I don't think I could pick out it. Don't, I don't think if you uh, asked me to really pick out a Tuberose note that I could do it. I think this is more um, just to add, I think, maybe some depth to the perfume with a base of Tonka, Gaiac Wood, and Benzoin. Beautiful kind of warm weather, I'm sorry, cold weather tobacco when you want to feel you know, this is like a warm me up type fragrance when it's cold. Bulgari's Man in Black. Uh, I will do a video. You know, I've got maybe three or four of these little samples, so I'll give them some full wears. I'll wear them as my scent of the day uh, and do videos on them sooner or later. Comes in at number 13. Number 12 is a category of fragrance that I really don't like. I've said I don't like it before. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually not, it shouldn't be surprising. Many fragrance addicts, if you want to call us that, or many fragrance connoisseurs don't like this style of perfumes because they see them as just kind of a little bit boring. And that's the citrus style. And you could throw in, you know, fragrances like Chanel's Pour Monsieur, Dior's Eau Sauvage, those old school, you know, citrusy, heavy uh, fragrances. And then as the years and the decades rolled on, they got more and more interesting. You know, so if you add in something like YSL Pour Homme or uh, Balenciaga Ho Hang uh, from the early 70s. They get more interesting than what, you know, Chanel was doing in the 50s or Dior in the 60s. And, you know, ditto if you move to the 80s and you add in Tiffany for Men or, you know, they, it's continually kind of evolved and got more and more interesting to my nose anyways. This is a 2007 release. This is a release that uh, Alberto Morias actually worked with uh, Francois Demachian, and it's a um, uh, it's a flanker of an Aqua de Parma that came out a hundred years ago or whatever it was. The original uh, Colonia came out in 1916, so this is a flanker of that, and it's called Aqua de Parma Colonia Intensa. Now, I will usually wear this in the summer. And I'll, I'll, you know, somebody uh, that I really trust, AC from the channel Smells Good, loves this fragrance. And he said it's one of his, you know, important meeting fragrances that he puts this on and he's always kind of, uh, you know, he grabs the attention of people. And uh, I could see that, although for me, um, it doesn't really fit my personality as well. Uh, but I, I see what he means. There is a, there's a... Uh, effortless chicness about it, elegance about it, kind of old school sophistication about it. There's freshness from ginger. 
There's Sicilian lemon, there's Calabrian bergamot, and there's cardamom in the top. The heart is neroli, which neroli is a uh, very expensive ingredient. Most people don't realize how expensive uh, neroli can be. There's artemisia and there's myrtle, and the base is musk, cedarwood, benzoin, leather, and patchouli. And I was really hoping that leather patchouli would be more amped up, more turned up in this release, but it's it's not. It's 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 there. Um, do I get a leather accord? Not really. You know, it's it's there kind of more in the base, but uh, it's kind of more citrusy and fresh. And so for very high heat, yes, this is nice, but every time I'm wearing it. Uh, I kind of wishing I'm wearing something else, if that makes sense. But for what it is, for this style of perfume, it is well done. It's the only Aqua de Parma I have in my collection. And actually, this is a house that uh, I really did not ex discover or explore very far. I haven't smelled the ones people hype up. I haven't smelled Quetica or Oud or, you know, any of the other ones. But um, But that is not a bad take on a citrusy fragrance and it lasts longer than like the normal aqua de parma colonia which lasts 45 minutes and then you just got to reapply i think this is an eau de cologne yeah this is an eau de cologne concentration believe it or not but it doesn't wear like an eau de cologne it wears kind of more like uh an eau de toilet but um not bad not bad but again it's not going to blow you away um so aqua de parma colonia intensa at number 12. Number 11. Okay, now we're starting to get more and more into the interesting fragrances for me. This is a fragrance that just came out a couple years ago, and it got a little bit of hype on YouTube. Um, a little bit. Well, enough, and it did well enough that it actually uh, spawned a flanker. There's a flanker of this, which uh, we'll talk about maybe later when we get onto another fragrance he made in, in, a, in a special note that's in that, ing in that fragrance. But this is called Philip Pline's no limit. No limits. Sorry. Of course, the S is a dollar sign at the end because it's it's Philip Pline. Uh, and if you ever want to laugh, just go to YouTube and look up the Philip Pline commercial. Uh, the Philip Pline commercial is absolutely hysterical. It's like some guy jumps out of a helicopter, you know, with an AK-47, blasts his way through, you know, just gets all the chicks, of course, you know, lands in his Lamborghini, or it's just insane. It's an insane uh, commercial, but it's Philip Pline to a T, right? And um, uh, this is a 2020 release, so it's three years old now. It's uh, bergamot, ginger, aquatic notes, black pepper, clove, cinnamon, star anise, cardamom, with a base of leather, cedarwood, dark chocolate, frankincense, patchouli, bourbon, vanilla, black, amber, oud, and wood. So you heard that right. There's oud and patchouli and dark chocolate and aquatic notes. It almost makes zero sense, but somehow it works. And actually, if you've smelled, I'll just give you just a quick kind of uh, comparison. If you have smelled um, either of these two right here, If you've smelled Guerlain's L'Instante Guerlain, or if you've smelled Nasomato's Pardon, that'll get you in the ballpark. But remember, it's designer, so I think both of these are probably better fragrances, but neither of these have aquatic notes. Um, you know, this one doesn't have oud. This one claims, I think, well, they don't give ingredients on there, but I think the consensus is it's a chocolatey patchouli with oud. Uh, and and so it's a it's a it's an interesting take, you know. Um, and it's a daring take. And I think it's a good fragrance. I think that uh the strangeness is kind of where it shines. But the fact that it's in a designer bottle, you know, I think I paid like 55 bucks for this 100 mil or something. No, I'm sorry, this is a 50 mil. Yeah, I think I paid like 55 bucks for this 50 mil. Um, you know, it's uh, it's in that designer price range, but I think it really punches above its belt for what it is. Now, I don't know. Uh, one thing I will say is I don't know about versions of this or what's going on with... Um, with Philip Pline as a house. It's now being marketed by Brands Beyond Beauty. I don't know if they were always marketed by Brands Beyond Beauty. It doesn't say anything like that on the bottom of mine. It just says Philip Pline Parfums. But I bought this like right when it came out. So, um, so yes, 
one to one to keep an eye on if you're a fan of you know patchouli and chocolate and spice it's a good fragrance it's not too shabby it's also kind of leathery in the dry down there's this leathery um oody woody designer dry down that's not too bad at all uh all right so that is number 11. number 10 is actually going to be the re-release uh of the fragrance that many claim to kind of kick to have kicked off the oud craze in the early 2000s and uh this is called ysl's m7 and this is the oud absolute version so the original version is going to be higher on the list uh, the Oud Absolu version comes in at number 10, and I will tell you this, if you can't find the original, and you won't be able to without paying a pretty penny, but if you don't want to pay, you know, the scalpers, the markups that uh, the people that have bottles of the original want, just go ahead and get this. This is a good fragrance, and, I, and I'm pretty sure you can still buy it right now at the counter, uh, but they hide it is the thing. My, my brother across the pond, Rich Mitch, was at, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, uh, YSL counters and uh, asked about this. And sure enough, they had it, but it wasn't displayed at all. Like, it was hidden underneath. They had to reach under and grab it and show them. And um, so a lot of people thought that this was discontinued. And so what they did with this one is they added a couple things. Like, for example, they added a note of um, myrrh. There's no myrrh in the original. Not that I know of. Not that they list. Uh, there may be some myrrh that just isn't listed. And um, they added a note of, um, they added a note of patchouli. There's no patchouli listed in the original. Uh, and they added a note of labdanum. I don't think there's any labdanum listed in the original, which there probably was. I bet you there was some of these ingredients, but uh, they didn't list them. So here they, they claim to have added a couple things. And they added, I think they amped up the orange note a little bit more. And if you look at the color of the juice, it, that orangish, you know, uh, look, and it doesn't have the fizz of the original. So when we talk about the original, the fizz is really what pushes it ahead. I love that cola-like opening. You don't get that in, in this version. Uh, they've really toned down that cola fizz-like opening. And that's probably one of my favorite parts of the fragrance. So, M7 Oud Absolute comes in at number 10. I still think this is a great, easy-to-wear designer Oud. You know, if you're somebody who kind of wants to dip their foot into Oud, but they're not ready to jump into $500 to $1,000 bottles of Ensar, uh, M7 is a good starting point. Okay, next on the list is a sample, and it's a sample of a perfume that I actually did a live stream on probably within the last month or so. Uh, and these were very kindly sent to me by Allie. So Allie, thank you very much. And the fragrance that we're going to be talking about today is called Journey Woman. And I really liked some of these women amouages. I think they were just amazing. Um, and I'm, and I'm really kind of kicking myself for not discovering some of these women's fragrances early. There's a couple that are high, high on my to buy list. Um, I was uh, I was a little blinded when I really first started my journey and that I just wouldn't it took me a long time to break down that that barrier if it said for women I didn't even bother smelling it which was a huge mistake for me because once I realized my mistake three or four years ago uh, then I was kind of felt like I was playing catch up like there would have been so much more for me to buy at cheaper prices too uh, seven eight years ago uh, when I really started my journey if I would have been more open-minded. And Journey Woman is a great example of that. This is a fantastic fragrance from 2014. Uh, it was a co-op between Alberto Marias and Pierre Negrin, which that co-op has many fruits um, on this list, and some of them very, very close to the top. Uh, and this is one of them. Journey Woman is basically a... Um, it's a... It... How would I describe it? I would describe it as, you know, whenever it comes straight out of the atomizer, you get this honeyed tea-like smell is what it smells like to me. And that honeyed tea smell is basically jasmine tea. Very unique note. I think this could be the only fragrance I've ever smelled with jasmine tea. And they've mixed it with osmanthus. So not only does jasmine tea have a little bit of fruitiness naturally to it, 
but Osmanthus has this natural apricot, leathery, animalic type feel, and it's a floral note. I love Osmanthus, one of my favorite flowers. And they've mixed it with nutmeg and then apricot on top of it. So you really get hit with this apricot fruity jasmine tea with cardamom and honey and florals. And then the base is cypriol, vanilla, pipe tobacco, musk, and saffron. It's completely unisex as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the florals do stick out. The jasmine sambac, the mimosa. There's a point in the fragrance when they kind of really come forward. But there's, a, there's some transitions here. It's a beautiful, beautiful fragrance. There is some sweetness but it's never too much. It almost feels like it's coming from the fruits and a little bit of, um, uh, you know, very intelligently used vanilla. So I did a uh, Amouage Woman's live stream where I sniff some of these. If you want to kind of see my initial reaction, you can go check out the, the live stream. And then next on the list, we have number eight. And number eight is a Gucci. Uh, and the first of actually a couple Gucci's on this list. And this is from their... Uh, higher end, I forgot what the collection's called, um, someone will tell me, I'm sure, but it's from their higher end collection, and it's called A Midnight Stroll. So it's the only one that I own from this higher end line, if you will, um, and A Midnight Stroll is, now these, by the way, before I go any further, these midnight, these um, higher end Gucci line that come in this bottle, I can't think of the name, but I'm sure someone will leave it in the comments. Um, they were meant to mix and match, okay? So the whole point was they were simple fragrances that were meant to, you could take, for example, the Voice of the Snake, which is the Oud, and you could mix it with the Midnight Stroll, and they were meant to blend together to create a, uh, a fragrance where the notes wouldn't clash. Um, which for a perfume that sold for three, four, five hundred bucks, I don't remember what these were, but they were not cheap. Uh, is I think a little, a lot, a big ask, you know, you're going to take these extremely expensive compositions and then start blending them. So you have to buy multiple bottles. I, I didn't get that at all, but this one really caught my attention because it's a beautiful incense and incense for me is just an easy sell. Anyways, I love incense, uh, incense and leather, and it's starting to turn into also oud are kind of easy sells for me. And so incense here is mixed with, uh, it's frankincense, a little bit churchy, but it's mixed with this cypress note. And the cypress note gives off this, um, you know, green foliage-like vibe, if you will. And so imagine you're taking a midnight stroll, but you're doing it in like the Pope's gardens or, you know, the gardens at the monastery at Santa Maria Novella you know, or something like that, right? There's green touches in the air, uh, but it's dark. Uh, incense has been burning all day because it's holy grounds. And there's also cade juniper wood. So there's only three notes, woody, smoky, spicy, kind of green, uh, and simplistic, but a very well done incense, extremely well done. Uh, and so I really like this one, probably my favorite from this, uh, from this line and I like these bottles they're kind of different you know it looks like they're kind of pan painted uh, interesting take except for the only thing that's bad about them is that if you pull the cap off too hard the little collar pops up sometimes and you got to pop it back down so not the best quality bottles but a good idea on the design just extremely overpriced I would love to smell some of the other ones I've never smelled before but they're just so ridiculously expensive that you know it's just, it's just kind of one of those things. Um, so a voice, a midnight stroll comes in at number eight and then number seven. Now we're going back to the late eighties. I mentioned, uh, Ohm de Cafe earlier from the late seventies where Alberto Moria still kind of had that particular style. Now we're moving into the late eighties. And again, it still feels like old school Alberto Moria at work here. And he got to work with one of the uh, all-time great perfumers, Roseanne du Matou, who just recently passed away last year. Rest in peace to him. And this is called Sybaris. And this is a, a fragrance that's discontinued. It was made for Puig. And Sybaris is um, a spicy masculine Chypre. And this actually took me a couple wears before I really figured it out. Um, 
because at first I was like, you know, I don't know about this. Uh, there's this like aldehydic cumin opening and it's very strong. The cumin in the top is, uh, is really aggressive and forthcoming. And it's mixed with some green notes and some citruses and stuff like that. And then it instantly goes into this very old school, you know, green artemisia, geranium, spicy geranium, you know, green carnation, um, cinnamon, which by the way, he will use that cinnamon note to perfection in the next couple of years. Um, something that they really perfected. I, I love the way late eighties, early nineties cinnamon notes were done for whatever reason. There's just something about the way they were done then that just really speaks to me with leather moss. Of course, it's a Sheepra. This is a proper leather Sheepra that no one really talks about. Um, I think it deserves to get more love from the vintage community. Sybaris is an amazing creation and Amber, there's frankincense in the base, there's patchouli and there's vetiver, a uh, very classic leather Sheepra, very well balanced. And outside of that cumin in the top, that's really the one thing that might, uh, put some people off because the cumin needs some patience. You need some time to, you know, get adjusted to this fragrance. It can be a lot is the thing at first, but uh, for a vintage lover like me, I think this is right up our alley and you'll be able to kind of see the progress of Alberto Morias's career. If you smell stuff like this from the seventies and then this from the eighties, and then you've got the two thousands, you know, and then you continue to move forward. You can really see how his career and blending progressed, but uh, Sybaris for the old school lovers of masculine perfumery, you'd be shocked this is Alberto Mordias. I mean, if if I just put this under your nose and you had no idea who it was, you would be, you'd no way in a million years would you guess this is Alberto Mordias unless you knew. Okay, next on the list, we've got number six. And number six is an Amouage. And I have an entire, I've got a vat of these uh, decants because I love this so much and I couldn't find a full bottle at a good price. So I said, screw it. And I just bought a crap load of, de of decants. Uh, and these are the vintage ones. They did keep this around, but they put it into the new bottles. And I decided I didn't want the new ones. I wanted the older ones. And this is called Opus 7. So Amouage Opus 7 is now known as Reckless Leather. So the ones that stayed and didn't get the axe were given names. Okay, The original Opuses didn't have names. I'll show you once we get to the... Um, once we get to the full bottle of Opus on this list. And so Opus 7 uh, was given the name Reckless Leather and put in the new packaging or whatever. But um, this is, again, the combination of Alberto Morias and Pierre Negrin. Killer combination. They did amazing work together. I wish they would do more. This is kind of a spicy, woody uh, if you've smelled Eugene's Desandres from Les Endemodables, uh, Antoine Lee made that fragrance. It'll get you in the ballpark, okay? This is a little bit different because there's oud. I don't think there's any oud there. Um, and there's some Cipriol here. I don't think there's Cipriol. But this is a deep, dark, earthy, smoky, green, resinous type of scent. Um... And they highlight a couple notes, which they use again to perfection on my, in my number one fragrance. Um, and that is the combination of um, Cipriol and frankincense. And so you get this Cipriol, frankincense, oud accord, right? Uh, they say that there's oud in here with leather, ambergris, patchouli, uh, ambroxan. So, you know, just like I mentioned earlier that uh, Alberto Morias loves throwing Ambroxan and stuff. He did it here as well. So this really has a big throw about it, but it smells extremely high class. It smells like it's that Amouage old school DNA. You have Cipriol, which is Nagamatha. I have an entire video on Cipriol if you want to learn more about it. Uh, frankincense, there's Costas Root, which this may be the best example of a Costas Root uh, fragrance that I've come across. Um, not a note that you see very often. Apparently it's, uh, the oil of the Costas root is what they actually use. And it's usually attributed, it's attributed, attributed to fragrances that have this kind of warm, woody, um, slight musky, earthy profile to them. It, many people say that Costas root smells like human hair. Like if you smell human hair, 
uh, or like the smell of an animal's fur. Um, you know, some people say it has irisy, violety aspects to it. I think it has more of the earthy aspects, personally. Animalic, in a way. There's an animalic, almost like maybe you're smelling a human's hair or an animal's fur, but they haven't been bathed. Like, it's they didn't just get out of the shower. You're smelling, um, you know, someone that's maybe been uh, out and about for a little bit, partying, uh, or, you know, something along those lines. But the galbanum in the top here is stunning, you know, and if you know the galbanum and Desandras, you'll kind of have an idea of that green, dark, mixed with the smoke. It's a beautiful fragrance, and I'm glad I picked up the decants, the little, you know, 2 ml samples that I could find because this is one I wish I could have got a full bottle but the prices were outrageous already because you know the people who had the vintage bottles knew uh what they had so I ended up just scoring a bunch of vintage decants which I'm very happy with so Opalus 7 Reckless Leather comes in at um number six number five is the original m7 so this is what the original M7 looked like. Uh, this is actually a tester bottle. You can see the notes there on the back. And you can see there's very few notes like I talked about earlier. There's no listing of myrrh. Uh, there's no listing of cystus labdanum. But there probably is labdanum in here. Uh, there's no listing of patchouli. Right? Uh, this actually had some mineralic notes. I forgot to mention. It almost has this mineralic-like quality that's missing from this. Uh, but what this lacks in note breakdown, it makes up for in strength, uh, and it, it adds this, um, the, the original also had this um, combination of rosemary and vetiver. Sorry, I keep dropping my little rag here. And rosemary and, um, and vetiver. Uh, there is still that mandarin orange that I mentioned. It feels like they kind of amped up a little bit in the re-release. Um, and there's a, there's a, uh, base of amber and musk and, and oud. And what I love about this and the reason that this is so high on the list is that when you first spray this, you're hit with almost like this ambery, uh, cola. And that ambery cola feels like Roja Dove then kind of took that idea and made Enigma pour homme, you know, in, in 2012 or whenever it was. So, uh, a decade later, he kind of used this uh, DNA, if you will, to then make Enigma Pour Homme. And so I'm a big fan of this. Um, is it the greatest oud fragrance of all time? Is it worth $500 on eBay? No, absolutely not. Is it a good perfume though? Yes, it is. And I much prefer the original to the re-release. But again, this is a very well done, um, it's a very good reinterpretation of the original, I would say. But uh, they just weren't able to capture that extra ambery, sparkly kind of, um, you know, the opening very cola-like. And they just weren't able to capture that with the, with the re-release. So, uh, M7, the original, comes in at number five. Number four. And a lot of people might have been thinking this is number one. This is number four for me. Uh, it's a very good release, though. Easily could have been number one. No one would have batted an eye. This is Gucci Guilty Absolute. So Gucci Guilty Absolute has been getting a lot of spotlight recently. It is discontinued. Uh, it's leathery. It's woody. It's got that. So the notes are basically uh, Nucta Cypress, uh, Vetiver, Patchouli, and there's a note in here called wood leather. Now, that wood leather note is actually a note that shows up again. And I've mentioned this in other videos and live streams. So if you've heard it before, apologies. But if you know this right here, Amouage actually put out a fragrance by Pierre Negrin, believe it or not. Uh, Alberto Morias's sidekick, his, his Robin to Alberto Morias's Batman. Uh, they put out a fragrance called Opus... 11, which is discontinued now, I believe. This is not one that got named, so I don't think it's going to be around. Came out one year after Gucci Guilty Absolute. This is the reason I don't have a backup of this. It's got that wood leather note, but imagine you added more of Amouage's like smoky frankincense style to this. Um, and you basically get, there's marjoram in here, there's oud and styrax. 
So Styrax makes it a little bit waxy in the dry down, but this is even bigger than this. You know, this kind of feels more tamed compared to Opus 11. So I kind of consider this my backup. But um, the reason that they smell so similar is they both have that wood leather note. And wood leather is also used in a fragrance from the house of Elisir called Extra Noir. And Extra Noir, I did an early impression on or a first impression on one of my live stream recently. So you can go check that out if you'd like. I liked it. That was, a, that was a good fragrance. I wouldn't run out and go buy it, but I liked it. And then the final connection to that wood leather note is the flanker of No Limits, which was called No Limits Super Fresh. Of course it was. Super Fresh. Uh, and Super Fresh came out in 2021, so one year after No Limits. And it also has this wood leather note that uh, apparently is restricted to certain perfumers. They can only use it. Only certain perfumers can use that wood leather note. Um, and Alberto Mordias is one of them, from what I hear. I don't know for sure, but, um, but yes. So long story short is I really like Gucci Guilty, absolute. There's also a ingredient uh, in here called Golden Wood. And Golden Wood was also used in Gucci Guilty Oud in uh, 2018. So he used it in Gucci Guilty uh, Absolute first. Golden Wood was used first here. Then it was used in Gucci Guilty Oud the very next year, which I don't have a bottle of that, in uh, 2018. Um, and so that Golden Wood note was another kind of captive molecule that uh, Al used in other Gucci fragrances. So anyways, long story short, it has this medicinal, some say Band-Aid-like smell. Uh, the mixture between the leather and the vetiver, that wood leather note and vetiver, gives off a very unique medicinal vibe, leathery, woody. I love it. I absolutely love it. And you can see that I put a decent sized dent in the bottle. But the reason I don't have a backup of this is again, because of this, this is kind of like my backup. So uh, Gucci Guilty Absolute, this is discontinued. So we're about to go through a phase. We, we're, we're in the discontinued phase already. Discontinued, 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 and then we're gonna go to one more that is still available, and then the last two are discontinued. So, um, next one, number three on the list, we're in the top three. Number three on the list is back to the House of Amouage, and this is indeed uh, the Great Journeyman. And I say great because I do think this is a great fragrance, and I think this is extremely underrated. Um, very few people give Journeyman the flowers that it deserves. I think that, uh, well, first of all, let's start with the elegance of that bottle. One of my favorite Amouage bottles of all time that no one talks about. Very few people talk about this anymore. Um, 2014, this is nine years ago. This is one of the best uses of Sichuan pepper, in my opinion. Brilliant Sichuan pepper note. Uh, there's also a Sichuan pepper note in a uh, Tom Ford that is also discontinued called Noir Anthracite, which is also a very unique um, take on this peppery Sichuan pepper note. And it kind of adds this flame, you know. Sichuan pepper, when I think about it, I think of like pepper on fire. And look at the color of the bottle. There is a little bit of that. So imagine like pepper on fire with spices, but it's softened by this um, Neroli note. And again, Neroli is a very expensive ingredient, but it adds this freshness along with the bergamot and juniper. Juniper adds a beautiful freshness to it, along with Amouage's normal frankincense and tobacco. Uh, there's a uh, geraniol note in here, and there's a base of cypriol. So again, cypriol is used, again, I mentioned cypriol in uh, Opus 7, Reckless Leather. So there's cypriol here used again. There's Ambroxan in the base, Alberto Morias' calling card, there's Tonka Bean, and there is Leather. And again, this fragrance is the dynamic duo. This is Alberto Morias and Pierre Negrin um, doing it again. And I love, this is one of my favorite, uh, one of my most underrated Amouage fragrances. You know, if you, if you like spicy fragrances and you, you know, will wear stuff, like Spice Bomb, or I don't know, you know, name a designer spicy fragrance that kind of gets talked about, and you've never smelled like a niche take on a spicy fragrance, check this one out. This is, I think this is like control the room elegant. This is like, 
you walk in to give a presentation, all eyes on you. You know, that's what this fragrance is. This is all eyes on me. And, but you're not there to, you know, be a comedian. You're there to give a serious presentation, right? That's what Journeyman is to me. It's just, uh, it's just control of the room. That's, that's how I feel when I wear this. And I absolutely love it. And I just don't understand. I don't understand for the life of me why this doesn't get more talk. Honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't doesn't click in my brain as to why Journeyman doesn't get more love and more talk. So uh, Journeyman comes in at number three. Number two, and Journeyman is actually the one that is still available, although I've never smelled the new version with Journeyman on the front. Um, but if you can find the ones that I have where it's on the side, on the collar, go for that. Uh, so, um, so number two is another discontinued fragrance unfortunately and this one's been discontinued for a long time though and it's actually the only one that I own from this house and it's a 1991 release and it's from the house of Romeo Jiggly and it's called Per Uomo. Romeo Jiggly Per Uomo, the green juice and let me tell you guys something about this. This is a beautiful designer fragrance. This is what designer fragrances used to be. There's tarragon in here, which is my secret, one of my secret notes. If I see tarragon, I'm apt to love it. Um, tarragon, you probably know tarragon from like, you know, you slice a piece of fish and put tarragon in there, right? In perfume, it sometimes comes across as sort of anise-like, but there's something different about it compared to anise in, when I smell it, but it's very hard to describe. Um, it adds it adds this level of old school masculinity to to a newer school designer fragrance in my mind. There's Brazilian rosewood in here, there's plum, there's uh, lemon tree, aldehydes, lavender, bergamot, and grapefruit. And you definitely get that plum when you first spray. Uh, you get that fruitiness of the plum. However, um, the lavender, cinnamon, and honey make this fragrance kind of what it is to me. If you like, and you guys might laugh, again, you might laugh, but I'm telling you, the way that it, uh, the way that it evolves for me, it doesn't smell the same. But if you know the way that this, you know, um, honey cinnamon thing kind of d develops with Balenciaga Pour Homme, there's a little bit of that here. Now it's a different fragrance, okay? So don't buy this and go, hey, this doesn't smell anything like Balenciaga Pour Homme. I'm telling you, it doesn't. But there is some sort of connection from the cinnamon. Uh, the way that the cinnamon was done in the early 90s is different than any other period I've experienced. I don't know why, uh, but it's spicy, it's woody, there's rose, there's old school carnation, there's ginger to add to that freshness with the grapefruit and bergamot, and there's a base of patchouli, oak moss, styrax, sandalwood, vanilla, amber, tonka bean, benzoin, musk, and cedarwood. Huge note listing. Uh, beautiful wearable designer scent. Now, I do have uh, a splash. I got this from Anuj, and I think this is long, long discontinued, but uh, there are bottles floating around out there. If you can find one, might be something to consider grabbing if you kind of like this style of fragrances. And uh, again, almost, put, almost made the top spot for me. Almost, but I'm infatuated with one perfume right now, and um, I've been infatuated with it for a while. I have multiple samples. I ran through probably six mils of this, so I've worn a lot of it, and I decided I had to get a full bottle. As soon as I knew it was being changed over to the other new bottle design, which I bought a new bottle design of uh, Silver Oud, and I'll never forgive myself for it, I was not going to make the same mistake again. Number one, Alberto Morias creation for me is... An 11 year old perfume from Amouage. This is Opus 6. Now, Opus 6 is uh, discontinued from what I know about it. It's not one of the ones that got its own name. And so I don't think they're going to continue Opus 6, honestly, unless they are going to end up naming it and keeping it. But as of now, it doesn't say it's discontinued, but I think the plan is, is that these are going to kind of go away. Uh, or maybe they'll give it its own name and keep it going. I have no clue. But uh, Opus 6 for me is, there is something special about this fragrance. And again, it's a combination of um, Pierre Negrin and Alberto Morias working together. 
And the whole concept of Opus 6 is to create an oud fragrance that has no oud. To create a fragrance that gives this oud-like feel with no oud. And for me, there is just something magical. Oh, it's just... You know, I've been saying for a long time that Frederick Mall's um, Promise is my favorite Cipriol-based fragrance. Nagamatha Cipriol. This might be it, honestly. I mean, this might be my favorite take on Nagamatha, on Cipriol. It's just brilliant. It's spicy, it's peppery, it's resinous. It has that perfect snapshot of Amouage uh, DNA, of frankincense. There's bay leaf, okay? Um, there's this bay leaf, bay laurel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's a silk vine note in here, which I can't say I know what a silk vine smells like, but I can imagine maybe there's some ivy-like touches in here. There's patchouli and a lot of patchouli in here. Uh, and of course, there's that Cipriol, which I talked about. There's a note called ambr Ambranum, which I think is a um, some sort of a amber fragrant ingredient. Ambranum. It's a fermentation ingredient. Uh, there's sandalwood. There's a note called Z11. And Z11 is another woody fragrance ingredient by Fermanish that this is the only fragrance I've ever come across that it's in. Actually, I think it may be in one other fragrance from, um, or maybe a couple, but I don't know any of them. I don't know any of the other ones. Some sort of woody ingredient. And it smells unique though. And finally, Gum Rock Rose. And Gum Rock Rose grows in Oman. It's one of the Oman, um, you know, it, it plants, if you will. And it's what they make labdanum out of. And so there's this sticky, well, extremely well executed labdanum. And this stuff has this somehow, whereas I despise the sweetness in uh, many of the early videos, uh, fragrances we talked about, there is a touch of sweetness here that comes from somewhere. I can't put my hand on it, but whatever it is, it is just, uh, it just, it just speaks to me. There's just something... The sweetness feels like it's coming from something so natural, even though all of the ingredients are basically listed, very synthetic feeling ingredients, stuff like Z11, Ambranum, all this crazy stuff no one's ever heard of, Silk Vine. When I wear this, it is just, it, it hits the brief on the head perfectly. I've worn this to work. Many people ask me, what in the world are you wearing? Uh, it is a beast. It's a beast mode scent. I like big fragrances, obviously. I like stuff from the 80s, 70s, 80s. I like big perfume, right? This fills a room. I don't care. I absolutely love it. I enjoy wearing it. Uh, and I think, I think that this very well may be my favorite from the Opus collection. I don't know. I haven't tried them all. But um, this Opus 7, you know, Opus 5, which is called Wood Symphony, that one is staying around. Uh, and Opus um, 9, which is Nathalie Lorson's take on like an animalic floral, and the one I showed you earlier, Opus 11. Um, and of course, the newer ones are okay, like Silver Oud and uh, Royal Tobacco. You know, those are okay, but um, I think my heart's really with, with Opus 6. It's so, so good. And what a brilliant Oriental, just a brilliant Oriental creation. And it really, I think... Um, it really, if you've never smelled oud before, if you've never smelled oud before, and again, I'm wearing uh, kind of a reference real oud fragrance today, and I'm not saying that these two smell alike, but you know what? Um, whenever I wear something like Opus 6, even though there's no oud in here, it will give you kind of an idea of what the experience of wearing oud would be like. And that's where I think they just won. They hit the brief on the head. Even though there's no oud in here, it gives the wearer the impression of what wearing an oud fragrance would be like. Um, so that's why I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy I got an older bottle. I have no clue what they're going to do to it, whether they're going to keep it or, you know, reformulate it or what. But uh, Opus 6, my number one uh alberto muddy ass creation so i would love to hear your feedback do let me know what your favorite um alberto muddy ass scents are i'm sure there are many people that have perfumes from him that uh i've never smelled or even never heard of he has 23 pages on parfumo so uh again this is a little bit of a celebration of his work 
and also a cool way to talk about a lot of fragrances all at once. So thanks everyone for watching. Do leave a like and a comment before you before you go. Love seeing your faces down below. Love interacting with you guys. And hopefully we'll be doing some live streaming very soon. Cheers. Take care. Bye now.